Greetings, colleagues. My name is Chris Fisser. I'm a family physician. Um, I work as a technical advisor for the Foundation for Professional Development. So without any further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Lucy Humawela, who is a, a close friend and, and a colleague for, for many years. I've been collaborating with him on many projects across South Africa. Dr. Mawela um, is very well known within the HIV medicine space. Um, and, and is often um, um, hosting uh, conferences and, and, and also a speaker on many uh, platforms. I'm sure many of you must have seen him before in, in, in terms of um, him sharing his wisdom and his years of clinical experience. Um, he is the executive director um, for Dr. Mawela Health Solutions. He's a medical doctor, he's an entrepreneur, and also a facilitator of learning um, that stretches over a period of more than 16 years. Um, he also holds, except for being a medical doctor, he also holds additional qualifications in HIV medicine, as well as tropical medicine. He's the founder of Dr. Mawela Health Solutions, um, a healthcare um, entrepreneurship firm, and uh, that has given birth to many other um, uh, organizations such as uh, Aqua Training School, uh, Clinic Telehealth, Clinical Care Platform, the Mbombela Women's Clinic, as well as Aqua Primary Care Clinics. Um, I know Dr. Mawela is a very, very passionate facilitator of learner and mentor, very passionate and fired up about improving the quality care that, that patients receive in terms of comprehensive HIV care and treatment. So without any further ado, I would like to hand over into the capable hands of Dr. Mawela. Thank you. All right. So yeah, so I know that we are going to be doing a number of uh, sessions, including tomorrow when we look at low level um, viremia. But for today, I want us to look at an approach for patients who are taking drugs that are regarded as part of our second line ART treatment and look at how then if these particular groups of patients start to have a detectable viral load, um, how would we then um, approach um, um, them? Um, so yes, as you know, I do know that there are platforms where one must share a lot of studies and try to back up, but I always prefer you know, practical application uh, because that's what we see every day. And I want to ensure that in the next few days, should you come across a patient who's taking DTG or Lopinavir, Tonavir with a detectable viral load, that you practically know how to approach um, those kinds of um, scenarios. So yes, uh, it's always good to start with a clinical scenario. So here today we have Kate, she's been taking what we call um, TLD, uh, Tenofove, uh, Lamivudin, DTG, I think they we've got Emtracetabine, but it's okay <laughs> uh, for one year. Um, her baseline CD4 count when she was started on this regimen was 156 cells and the six months viral load was uh, fully suppressed. She completed TB treatment as you see here um, today. She completed TB treatment last month. Her TB smear at the end of treatment was negative. So we are quite happy that uh, she did well. She attends the clinic today for her 12 months follow up. And as you talk to her, she does not have any complaints and she's clinically um, stable. So I would then like to pose a, a one of our first questions. Um, I'm going to launch it myself if it's fine with the conferencing team um, and ask you um, which of these, uh, are say, I mean, during this visit, when we see patients 12 months after starting art, what the tests and assessments um, do we need to do? You are allowed to select more than one um, option and we will always give this uh, poll 30 seconds. So you are left with five seconds really to, to fully engage um, and, and participate. <clears throat> Let's all participate so that we it can be an engaging and, and fulfilling um, experience. All right, so I'm going to stop there and then maybe show you, you know, um, your results and what you are looking at. <clears throat> Most of you are saying, yes, at 12 months, we must do a viral load. And equally, we should do a CD4 count and a creatinine clearance. And I think 
those are the probably the three tests that we would need to do if a patient presents after 12 months of being on ARVs, a creatinine clearance, a CD4 count, and a viral load. So a viral load is very important because we use viral loads really to monitor treatment success and to detect if patients are not doing well on treatment and if there's a need to review and, and really consider better um, regimens. However, an HB would only be done if a patient is clinically anemic and we need to check something or to monitor patients who are taking a drug like Zidovudine. So HBs are not done routinely. Also with your ALTs, it is not a routine test unless if you suspect some liver toxicity or your patient is taking a drug like uh, nevirapine. So for this particular scenario, option A, D, and E would be the test um, that we would want um, to do for our patient right there. So the scenario continues with the second question to say you requested the test and the results are back. So a CD4 count is always done at baseline and again at 12 months. And the 12 month CD4 count, you're looking at it there, it's 148. Remember the baseline one was 156. Her creatinine clearance is 80, uh, which is uh, uh, acceptable, you know. Pap smear was also done, which is normal, and her viral load is 1,500 copies per mil. So you then need to advise me um, what would be your next step um, at this point um, in time? What would you like um, to do uh, for our scenario right there? Now that the results are back, um, do you want to consider some of the um, actions you need to do? I encourage all of us to participate. Um, five more seconds. Yes. All right. You may select more than one answer if you believe uh, something else uh, needs also to be done. All right. So I'm going to stop right there and then share with you the results. So yes, uh, adherence counseling, you can never go wrong. You know, at any given visit, you know, adherence counseling is very important. It, it is uh, provided as a support system, but also as an intervention, especially where patients are not doing well on treatment. I'm happy with those who are saying continue current regimen. And the only reason why we want to continue is because this is our first high viral load. So we don't want to rush and start making unnecessary um, drug switches. Um, repeating the viral load after three months is probably part of the plan. So we would continue the current regimen, repeat the viral load in three months time. And between these uh, two viral loads, this one down five and the next viral load in three months time, we want to provide a series of uh, support and interventions to ensure that we intervene and we see if our patient can resuppress again. Contacting an expert is never a bad idea, particularly in this scenario, because you have a patient who's taking a drug like dolutegravir and they have a detectable viral load. This is something that we don't expect, especially for someone who's taking DTG as part of their first line, and also it's still within the first year, you know, of taking ARB. So we expect most of our patients to be suppressed. Be weary of option two there. You always have to be very cautious and very careful not to be in a rush to intervene when patients have high or detectable viral loads. And also remember the golden rule, which we will still discuss uh, uh, later on, to never switch a single drug when a patient has a detectable viral load. You know, so switching DTG to lopinavir, yes, lopinavir is more robust. You know, it might survive uh, our error in clinical practice, but it is not something that we, we should be doing. So I hope um, these, uh, you, you, you are making sense of these particular um, options. So just to talk a little bit about Dolutegravir treatment failure, you know, as a challenge. And it's a challenge because we don't necessarily expect people who are receiving DTG as part of first line to be failing, right? And also we lack really the, the required history with the drug 
to be able to tell exactly to say if someone is taking dolutegrave and they have a high viral load, you know, are they failing? You know, and you would see later on that even uh, should you detect uh, specific mutations that might be associated with DTG, more than half the time, the clinical significance of those particular uh, mutations, we do question it, you know, so, so it's a very, it's actually a challenge when someone has a high viral load on DTG, half the time we might not have the confidence to really uh, 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 do something because we have a sense that it's probably, you know, the first hundred reasons for a high viral load when a patient is taking dolutegrave is adherence. So you have to address adherence a hundred times before you can even consider that this is a true um, treatment failure, you know. So patients who have a high viral load from a dolutegrave based regimen, we have to assess them by assessing if your patient is struggling to take the medicines because maybe they are experiencing some side effects, if there is food, drug, you know, um, interactions, especially drug drug interactions. In my own experience, half the issues we have with DTG have to do with other medicines that our patients are taking whether they've disclosed to us um, or not. You might need to assess if your patient has a poor you know, absorption. Is there a place to do therapeutic drug monitoring, you know, uh, which would then inform you if uh, there's issues of malabsorption or even uh, poor adherence. And then also the timing of uh, resistance testing. So at what point do you then decide to do a resistance test when a patient has a high viral load taking um, DTG, you know. So this is quite um, um, important. And our guidelines do, in a way, also support the idea that patients who have persistent high viral loads on DTG should probably be considered for a PI-based regimen. But remember, just switching regimens does not address any adherence issues um, that we need um, to pick up. You would see that in our guidelines, in terms of assessing patients who have high viral loads, we rely on this framework that we call the A, B, C, D, E, A, where we assess adherence, issues of side effects, you know, mental health screening, uh, substance and alcohol abuse, where patients have not disclosed, therefore they lack, you know, the uh, uh, adequate support uh, socially. Does our patient have a new infection? Are they taking the drugs as prescribed or have we prescribed the correct dosages um, of these drugs? With DTG particularly, I think drug-drug interactions are probably the, the biggest risk factor which can hamper the effectiveness um, of this particular drug. Then at some point, you know, we have to have guidelines to say at what point do we do a resistance test? And if we do it, will we be able to interpret it and really make sense of what, you know, the next steps are? I mean, I have spoken about drug interactions. Our patient uh, in this instance was taking a rifampicin-based regimen which could have reduced the effectiveness of DTG unless if the correct adjustments um, were done, like increasing dolutegrave to 50 milligrams um, 12 hourly, and also continuing this uh, induction for at least two to three weeks, you know, once uh, rifampicin has been stopped. We also need to assess if our patient might be taking some of these drugs. You know, these drugs are now being prescribed for sleeping, <laughs> sleeping tablets and so on. So drug-drug interactions quite common. Uh, metformin would increase, you know, uh, I mean, DTG would increase the blood levels of metformin, which might not necessarily lead to reduce effectiveness of DTG. And everyone in today's world is taking some supplements, uh, whether it's zinc, you know, everyone is so fearful of becoming sick that we are preloading our our immune systems with a whole lot of vitamins, but these uh, minerals and vitamins can interact and form complexes with DTG, therefore increasing its um, excretion um, um, and, and, and limiting absorption. So this is quite um, an important slide and probably for me, one of the biggest risks 
of putting DTG um, in harm's way or at risk, right? So in terms of viral load uh, monitoring, right? Viral loads must be done at six months. And this is a 12 month visit. This is when we are seeing our case, uh, Kate with a high detectable viral load on DTG. And then following that, we have to do monthly viral loads. Obviously here, the presumption is that you are dealing with someone who's remaining suppressed. Therefore, you would follow the standard um, follow-up schedule. However, in our instance, our patient has a high viral load, which is more than 1,000, and we have one reading. Therefore, we are not you know, confident. We are not able to start to play around with drug. You can't do a single drug substitution when the viral load is detectable. And equally, we can't switch to a second line regimen because you have one viral load you know, that is high, which is where we were. However, this assessment must be done A, B, C, D, E, which I've just explained, then repeat the viral load in three months time. So that's why when I asked, what is your plan? Those who said, number one, continue the regimen, two, provide enhanced adherence counseling, three, repeat the viral load in three months time. This would be your key really um, um, approach um, to this particular patient, right? But know that this three months is not necessarily, you know, enough for DTG. Actually, it might be a bit too early as well, because we know we won't be able to really intervene too early because we know that, uh, like I said, the first 100 reasons why you have a high viral load on DTG is probably because there's probably adherence issues or drug drug interaction. There's something to be resolved, not necessarily that we need you know, to, to be switching. So I'm going to pose the third question and I'm asking you with respect to a patient who develops TB whilst taking a dolutegravir based regimen, what are some of the um, options um, that you would have um, to, to intervene uh, uh, for, 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 for this uh, patient? What are some of the approaches to counter the effect of uh, rifampicin on these um, um, drugs? All right, so yes, 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 yes. Uh, you have a single choice. I think if I had made it to be more than one choice, it would have been a bit different. But yeah, you have a choice. Uh, um, um, one, what would be the best <laughs> choice, right? Yeah, all right. It's 30 seconds. I'm going to stop and I'm going to discuss, you know, these results with you just quickly. So this is very important, right? Number one, switching DTG to effavirenz, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a possibility, but it's not something that we fully recommend, particularly uh, because your patient would have been on DTG already. We generally we know that effavirenz is the safest drug to give with uh, rifampicin, and if it was a newly diagnosed HIV positive patient who is on TB treatment, then we would recommend an effavirenz based regimen, mainly to reduce the pill burden um, um, on our patient. So the switching to effavirenz or lopinavir, ritonavir, which is that second option there, um, is not, those are, those are things that are not necessarily recommended. However, it is always recommended that if a patient develops TB whilst um, taking a dolutegravir based regimen that we make a dose adjustment from 50 milligrams daily to 50 milligrams um, 12 hourly or twice a day. Um, we don't stop ARVs at all. I can assure you um, of that. So I think uh, we all have um, some clarity um, up to there. So I'm going to continue. So he asked Kate now. So we, 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 we asked Kate to come back after three months, you know, and uh, she's back now. She's actually coming back after her three months visit. So she's still on that um, TLD regimen. She is well. She's got no TB or STI symptoms. You saw her every week for the first month during this three month uh, period. Then you saw her monthly. She attended reliably with excellent pill counts. She denies having any side effects, no signs of mental health or substance um, abuse. So you'll see that this particular paragraph, it's giving you those answers to the ABCDE to say it was done and it seems like she's doing okay. 
However, one further inquiry, she reveals that uh, her DTG dosage was not adjusted with TB treatment, right? So now it could be, not it could be, it's probably an area of great concern that she did complete TB treatment uh, in the first 12 months of her ARVs. And unfortunately, we forgot or we didn't see it, whatever the story is. Now, the viral load done at three months, remember the first one, which was done when she was 12 months on ARVs was 1,500. And then we said, come back after three months. It's now 20,000, right? So really, I also don't know <laughs> what, what the, 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 what's the plan, but the, I truly believe that we would engage on the plane. So what do you guys want to do? Uh, she's back, uh, three months viral load is 20,000. You can select more than one, one option there, but uh, um, yeah, give it your best shot. Give it your best shot. I will give you five more seconds. Let's try and participate. Your voting is coming in slowly. It might be network issues as well. Yo, it's a mixed uh, bag. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop it there and then maybe um, show you uh, the results. So like I said, initially providing adherence is never you know, a bad idea. Should we switch to second line? I mean, that is the, the big question there. And uh, I, 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 I also don't know. I don't know, to be honest with you. <laughs> we will see the next few slides what the, the guidelines you know, are saying. Should we do a resistance test at this point in time? Hmm, interesting that 53% of you believe that we should do a resistance test. And I tell you what, we, when we get to, let me not actually speak, we will see in, in the next few slides, continuing the regimen, repeating the viral load in six months time. And if you look at it very careful, almost all these options are a possibility. It depends on you know, your assessment of the patient, your assessment of the reasons why the patient has a high viral load and the patient is taking a very good regimen. So we, we are not in a hurry, you know? So yeah, um, let me <laughs> stop there. It's quite interesting even for me uh, to say what exactly are we going to do? But if you look at the, our own guidelines, right? They say, when you review your three months viral load, remember our first viral load was 1,005, the three months viral load is now 20,000. So it has went up 20 times, right? Now you have to ask yourself, uh, which regimen is our patient taking? And now we are on this particular uh, box right there. So this box says, if a patient is taking an integrase-based regimen or a protease inhibitor-based regimen, you must consider switching to second line if virological failure is confirmed. And my question to you is, have we confirmed virological failure, right? Because yes, the definition of virological failure in the context of an integrase or a PI-based regimen, we need to have a viral load on at least three occasions over a course of two months, I mean, of two years, right? So our patient has been on ARV for almost one year, uh, three months, Let's for, for argument's sake, one year, three months, and uh, we do have two viral loads, we don't have three, um, unless, right, she, we can confirm immunological or clinical treatment failure, right? So, you know, that is where uh, the issues are um, right there. So th does she meet this criteria? She's not yet two years and we, we have two viral loads, but there might be an issue which is banning. There is a banning platform from this case. The banning issue is the fact that her DTG was not adjusted. I think this is what is uh, making us a bit, you know, shaky and not knowing exactly what is it uh, we must do. Now, regarding DTG failure, right? Regarding DTG failure, which of the following mutations are associated with uh, DTG failure? Uh, I want to see. If we will still discuss mutations later, but I just want to see, uh, you know, do, do, do you know of any 
mutations associated with DTG. <laughs> you may select more than one answer, more than one. It's probably an unfair question, isn't it? Unless if you, you have seen a genotype uh, from a patient uh, who, who took uh, DTG uh, before for a while. Okay, I'll give you three more seconds. Let's all participate. It's always nice when we are all engaged. Uh, yes, yes, come guys. Yes, I can see, yes. All right, it's probably also the network, but I'll share with you the results. I will tell you which mutations are not associated with DTG. K65R, it's a signature mutation associated with tenofovir and and abacavir. And then M184V is a signature mutation associated with lamivudine, emtricitabine, and abacavir. So obviously, your answer lies with the three mutations in the middle of the pack. It's either R263 or E157 or Q118R, you know. So let's then um, um, do it together. So yes, um, a number of mutations have been associated with DTG. The first one being R263K there, then G118R, and then E157Q, right? But the question is, if you do a resistance test, uh, let's say for our case scenario, and really the obvious indication for that patient. So number one, if a patient has two viral loads, and they've taken DTG for less than uh, two years. And this DTG is part of first line ART. There is no indication for a genotype test, right? We don't do DTG resistance testing when DTG is used as part of the first line ART regimen. So let's, let's just clarify that, right? However, patients who take a PI or DTG and they are exposed to a significant drug-drug interaction, particularly rifampicin, where the adjustments were not done. That is an indication for uh, a resistance test um, to be done. And I'm putting this slide to say, if you do a resistance test, right, and these are the common mutations found with um, a DTG right there, you know, what would these mutations mean? Because for example, 263K, R263K, if it is selected, it leads to diminished viral uh, 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 and, uh, fitness. So it makes the virus to be less virulent, it replicates slowly. So it's a, probably it's a mutation like a M184V, it's a preferred uh, mutation. It does not necessarily make the drug to be less um, effective um, right there, right? If you look at uh, uh, e, E17Q, you know, it causes low level resistance and most patients who have this particular mutation still suppress um, ultimately, right? One of the uh, mutations which can be a bit significant is G118R, which tends to happen in patients who are given dolutegrave uh, monotherapy, which was not the case. But all I'm trying to get to is that these mutations are there, half the time patients are still able to resuppress in the presence of these mutations. And patients do have clinical, good clinical outcomes, even when these mutations have been picked up after a resistance uh, uh, test. So, so, so a resistance test, in that option is something that can be done because we are exposed to a patient where TB adjustments um, um, were not done when we needed to do them, all right? So Kate was not switched. He, the plan was to continue and, and, and wait until she gets to two years. So here, is, here she is. She's now two years on ARVs. Um, she's still taking TLD for, for argument's sake. And this is the summary. Remember the six months viral load was suppressed. At 12 months, we had a viral load of 1,500. There was an 18 months viral load in excess of 20,000. There is a 24 months viral load, which is 16,000, right? But the CD4 count was repeated during the 24 month viral load and it's 98. She, has, she now has a CD4 count of 98. 
the HB seems okay, hepatitis B is negative. She's not complaining, she has not missed, so she's still adhering to TLD uh, at this point in time. So having looked at where we are, I wonder if uh, you are going to change your mind uh, at this point in time. Um, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. I mean, what's your next steps? What do you want to do uh, with Kate? What do you want to do? Now you have two years. You have two years. Now, some of you are saying she has improved, continue current uh, regimen. You might be fooled by the viral load, isn't it? Because the viral load is now 16,000 from 20,000. Maybe that's why we think she has improved, but I don't think she has. Utterance counseling, yes. Switch DTG to Lopina Bear. Remember the rule. Remember the rule. Uh, it is, uh, we don't do a single drug substitution in this instance. The viral load is detectable and she has had a detectable viral load for a while. Uh, prescribe a new second line ART regimen. Yeah, 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 probably, probably. Um, let's see if she meets um, the criteria, but there's things I want you to pay attention to at this point in time. Number one is that she has been on ARVs on a failing regimen for two years, right? This particular regimen, it is allowed in terms of our guidelines to get this far. Unless if she's clinically unstable, now there is no new opportunistic infection, so we are still okay. However, her CD4 count is now 98. Remember the baseline CD4 count was 156. This particular CD4 count is significantly below the pre-treatment um, CD4 count. So she does not only have virological treatment failure, she now has immunological um, treatment failure. So she's got immunological and virological treatment failure. We do not have any clinical deterioration um, at this point, right? So um, I tell you, we, we, if, if obviously now she meets the criteria, it's been two years, there's immunological failure, the viral loads are still high. So we have to consider, you know, um, switching her to second line, not necessarily um, um, one drug, uh, which is what uh, we wanted to do. But what would be what would be an ideal regimen? So she's taking TLD, and then uh, we now have some. We believe she meets the definition of treatment failure. Which of these three regimens uh, would you um, uh, recommend for her? All right, let's all participate. Five more seconds as uh, we all try. You can only choose once this time around because it's a regimen, right? Okay, I'll give you five more seconds. Let's all participate. Don't worry, it's anonymous. We will never see who selected which one. Just have fun and we learn together, all right? Great stuff. So let me show you your results and then give you some tips. Number one, you must be careful of a single drug substitution. You see, if a patient is taking TLD and you give TL and lopinavir, this is, you have basically stopped dolitegravir and gave um, lopinavir ritonavir. It's a single drug substitution in a patient who has a detectable viral load, right? Even option, op, so option C and option D are, are basically, you are going to give lopina ver monotherapy in a way because once tenofovir ver is out due to failure, abaca ver equally is out. Remember K65R would affect these two drugs um, in the same way, right? That first regimen there is like you're going backwards. We never go backwards. Obviously, she has never been on effavirenz before, but she has already failed TDF, and we don't like NNRTIs in patients with the previous treatment failure, right? Now, the best regimen really is to give Zidovudine, Lamivudine together with Lopinavir, Ritonavir. You would have given a new regimen with at least two new drugs, you know, or two new classes uh, of drugs right there. So this is probably the best regimen uh, for our patient um, at this point in time. Obviously, depending on her hepatitis B status, 
and luckily her hepatitis B status is negative. So we would really um, accept um, that um, at this point in time. All right, so second line regimens uh, 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 for adults, remember this is just to show you you know, progression that if a patient is taking a fibrance and they fail, we generally prefer to transition them or to switch them to a dolutegravir based regimen. Now, our patient is taking dolutegravir as part of a first line um, ART regimen. And you can see there, there's already a caution to say, beware drug drug interaction every time you use DTG, right? Now, obviously, if we have confirmed treatment failure, she then needs to be considered for a protease inhibitor um, kind of ART uh, regimen. And there we are, you know, if a patient has taken an integrase-based regimen for more than two years, and that regimen is a DTG-based regimen, resistance testing is not required if DTG is used as part of first-line ART regimen. Her hepatitis B status is negative. Therefore, the best regimen is Zidovudin, Lamivudin, and Lopinavir, um, Ritonavir. So this is quite um, um, important um, right there, right? So remember now, um, DTG resistance, yes, I spoke about drug-drug interactions, but I need you to be very careful. You saw when I showed you the mutations that there is uh, the G118R, that that particular mutation is quite common in the context of dolutegravir monotherapy. But I know nine of us would outright prescribe dolutegravir on its own. So what do, why, why, how, under what context are we talking about DTG monotherapy? I call it clinical monotherapy. What is this uh, concept? Uh, and it's my concept, please, I must say uh, IP it. <laughs> clinical monotherapy, why, why would I call it? It's because when you look at the prescription, it has three drugs. You have a prescription that has uh, tenofovir, Lamivudin and Dolutegravir, you know, on the script there, it's three drugs, but clinically, because your patient might have a history of being on Tenofovir and Lamivudin before and failing those two particular drugs, clinically, because of the resistance profile of your patient, you have, in essence, a, a, a prescribed a monotherapy you know, a DTG monotherapy. Another common context is where patients are taking TEE, tenofovir, emtricitabine, and efavirenz, and we say, hey, transition, transition everyone. We've got a better drug and the people with high viral loads, including those which we will discuss tomorrow with viral loads that are below 1,000 but above 50. You know, the viral load is 900 and uh, you are saying, no, but it's below 1,000, let's transition this patient to TLD. It's a single drug substitution where the virus is detectable, and some of those viruses might have already mutated, making tenofovir and lamivudin ineffective. Basically, you would have given DTG monotherapy. So clinical monotherapy is where the prescription has three drugs, but because of the resistance profile of the patient's uh, virus, you know, uh, only one drug is susceptible, which is DTG, and that is what we call DTG uh, monotherapy. So it is a very good drug, DTG. However, we want to protect uh, this drug by always ensuring that we have a strong NRTI backbone whenever dolutegravir um, is used. If you suspect that your NRTIs are compromised then DTG is not necessarily the best drug. You should consider lopinavir, ritonavir. I do know that there's a recent studies published that are sort of also starting to suggest that that might not be the case, that DTG is as potent as lopinavir, and it should be able to handle, uh, you know, and, and, and fully suppress a patient who's got a weakened NRTI backbone. However, our guidelines in the country still do not recommend that you use DTG where the NRTI backbone has been compromised. So please, uh, uh, let's remember that, right? So let's look at quickly the indications for resistance testing in adults. You know, any, any adult, right, 
who's failing a PI-based regimen, a resistance test can be done. Any adult who has high viral loads or failing a DTG-based regimen, right, but where DTG is used as part of second line, this is very important. So first line DTG treatment failure, a resistance test is not um, required. And really these particular two cases, it's always a good idea to discuss with, with an expert uh, of note. And then again, any other with a, a, an elevated viral load on a PI or DTG based regimen, irrespective of whether first line or second line where the patient received a rifampicin containing regimen and we forgot or we missed to boost um, the ART regimen. And that is the scenario that we were looking at. It's a patient who's taking DTG first line, but because when the patient was taking TB treatment, the boosting was not done, therefore a resistance test would have been indicated so that we can decide if we need to be changing or even improving um, um, the regimen, right? And then lastly, which is also equally important, you know, newly diagnosed, imagine a patient who received PrEP. Remember PrEP, it's tenofovir and emtricitabine, and then they fail PrEP. That means they test positive whilst taking PrEP, right? How sure are you that tenofovir and emtricitabine are still potent for that patient? And if, if now you have to start them on ART and you give them a TLD, there's a very high potential that you'd be giving DTG uh, a monotherapy, clinical monotherapy, right? Hence, in our guidelines, it is indicated that if you are going to initiate a new patient who failed PrEP in the last six months, it's important that you do a resistance test so that you can determine if you need to use a, a different or a better NRTI uh, a backbone as with the DTG um, at that point in time. So quite um, important. Um, um, this is just my first session to summarize uh, session one on DTG failure, you know, to say, remember adults who are not fully suppressed after 12 months of DTG, we have to do adherence um, um, assessments. A uh, few seconds, this thing is appearing again. We have to, to, to assess them, review drug-drug interactions, um, um, do a viral load at least at three occasions over two years. And if they have met the definition of treatment failure, um, if they are taking DTG as part of first line, we probably need to switch them. If they are taking DTG as part of second line, we probably need to do a resistance test and then discuss with an expert. I mean, that is really... Um, the approach um, right there. Um, Chris, uh, before I continue, I want to take a, a one question, if there is one question, as I sip my water, then I want us to look at the a, a second line failure from a PI-based um, regimen. Dr. Chris, are you there? Yes, I'm definitely here. Yeah, thanks a lot, Lesejo. It's been, it's been a little bit quiet here. There, there was a colleague a little bit earlier that has raised their hand. Um, yes. However, I see the hand has been lowered now. So um, uh, there's, uh, uh, there, there's no specific questions that I see from my side at, at the present moment. Um, All right. So unless if there's anyone that would, I, I, I do see that uh, one colleague has raised their hand. I will allow you to talk right now. Um, please go ahead, colleague. You can just unmute your microphone, the one that has raised their hand. Unmute your microphone, and uh, then uh, you should be able to engage directly. Please okay. go ahead. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, my name is Maideline Santana. Um, I'm the clinical manager for Johannesburg. Uh, a clinical forensic medicine. We are treating patients with regard to the post exposure prophylaxis, as you know. So hmm. uh, if, if, the, if, if we come across a case where a, a, a patient becomes positive after uh, giving prophylaxis treatment uh, after the exposure for hmm. 28 hmm. days, which hmm. will be the best uh, regimen to start on ARB? Yes, so as far as I know, because I have reviewed the, um, the, the, the recent PEP guidelines, I'm not sure the most recent one. For PEP, 
Remember now we are using a triple drug therapy. You know, in the in the olden days, we would have used two drugs. Let's say Zidovudin with Lamivudin or Tenofove with Emtricitabine. But as it stands now, for post-exposure prophylaxis, our guidelines recommend a triple drug therapy irrespective of the risk. And one of the regimens fully recommended is TLD, right? So if you look at it, if you are giving PEP and you are using TLD, your patient was negative when you started, maybe after six weeks when you retest your patient, uh, they test positive on TLD, right? I wouldn't even change the regimen. You just continue that regimen and then you repeat the viral load in six months time from the time when the HIV was diagnosed and hopefully at that point in time, um, your patient um, remains uh, fully suppressed. So the risk with post-exposure prophylaxis, prophylaxis sorry, is, very, uh, is very low versus with pre-exposure prophylaxis because with pre-exposure prophylaxis, we are using two drugs. So if the HIV virus is exposed to two drugs only, um, the risk of uh, 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 the virus replicating in the presence of these two drugs is very high and therefore mutations might happen, which would weaken our NRTI uh, backbone. So with PEP, you don't have a lot of uh, worries, but with pre-exposure prophylaxis, you do have um, some worries right there. Um, I don't know, Chris, does that sound sufficient? <laughs> yes. Thank you for that. There's another question from Lungi Kudzwayo, who is asking whether they are allowed to do resistance testing at primary healthcare level, or um, is that only facilitated through a doctor referral, the resistance testing? Yeah. So two things. One, it depends uh, where you are working, because I'm not sure the audience is probably from all over you know, the country. For example, um, with the current national ACC rollout program, capacity has been built for hospitals and community health centers, so CHCs and hospitals. So where there's a CHC and there's a trained staff, the nurse and the doctor are trained, right? They are able to assess patients who are feeling second line request um, the appropriate test like your resistance test when indicated and work with maybe a, an infectious disease or an expert or a mentor or a doctor at an HIV clinic um, uh, to manage the patient without referring the patient for that particular um, test. So, so that is the, the why I'm answering it this way. For a normal small clinic, what we would call a PHC eight hour clinic, this test is not necessarily indicated or required to be done at that level. You might need to refer a patient. However, if you have a doctor who supports you, your mentor, you know, together with that particular um, 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 clinician, you may help the patient without, you know, avoiding unnecessary uh, referrals uh, for, for your patient. So, and then I know that different provinces also have different uh, uh, protocols in case that certain hospitals have been designated to run this particular uh, test uh, and so on. So also check your local provincial protocols, but where there are trained staff, um, the test could be um, requested. Yeah. All right. Um, Chris, I may continue then with the rest of the presentation. Please do go ahead. I'm not seeing any questions okay. at the specific Thanks, moment, but okay. uh, colleagues that are calling, please, please do continue in uh, posting uh, your questions on the Q&A. Thanks, Lesejo. In understanding um, treatment failure broadly, we have to understand how HIV you know, operates, and it's easier by understanding the HIV um, life cycle. Um, remember, HIV has a bilipid membrane, a nuclear capsid, which hosts the genetic material from the virus, including two strands of RNA and some enzymes um, in there. You would see that one of the steps is the attachment uh, of HIV to some of the receptors on our CD4 cells 
your CD4 and its core receptor, particularly your CCR5 um, core receptor, the viral genome after attachment and the fusion of the membranes, the viral genome is then released into the cytoplasm. You can see there the two strands of RNA, which are converted to DNA by an enzyme called um, reverse transcriptase. So it decodes and transcribes a single strand RNA eventually to a double strand viral genome or DNA right there. So note this enzyme, which is part of the enzyme brought in by the virus. Now this double strand DNA would then be transported into the nucleus where the viral DNA or viral genome would be inserted or integrated with the host DNA um, um, in the nucleus there. And this insertion or integration is facilitated by an enzyme called integrase, right? So integrase, reverse transcriptase, these are enzymes brought in by the virus together with these two strains um, of RNA. Now, the, the viral RNA would then be transcribed again uh, as part of messenger RNA, which codes for certain um, um, nucleosides, coding for certain amino acids that would code for certain proteins, and eventually, you know, coding for the formation of the uh, viruses. Now, there's an enzyme called protease, right? Protein protease. So its function is to cleave and to cut what we call these uh, uh, multi-protein chains, long strands that are cut, you know, um, um, which would then enhance the maturation of these viruses into baby virions. Then they go and infect more and more cells, right? So there's three enzymes, really, reverse transcriptase, integrase, and protease. And I'm not teaching about the drugs, but I wanted you to appreciate the process and to note that the biggest issues with the, the, the HIV virus and its ability to mutate lies with the, the, the reverse transcriptase enzyme. And this particular uh, reverse transcription from RNA to DNA lacks this error proofing mechanism such that every time this uh, enzyme makes a mistake, it is not detected as abnormal and it therefore would produce viruses that are a bit different, you know, from the uh, mother virus um, right there. So a virion, a baby virus, right, uh, has a half-life of 30 minutes. Can you imagine if me and you, we had a half-life of 30 minutes? I'm sure you wouldn't be in this webinar. You would be doing what you, you have always thought you have been called to do, whether spending time with your kids. You know, if you have 30 minutes to live, what do you spend your time doing? So a virus in 30 minutes, it needs to achieve, you know, its life uh, uh, purpose uh, right there. On a daily basis, billions and billions of baby viruses, you know, um, are produced and the Fourth bullet there is the important bullet, bullet to know that for every 10 to 30,000, you know, nucleotide, uh, this reverse transcriptase enzyme incorporates a wrong nucleotide. And remember, if a nucleotide changes, it means the coding for certain amino acids will change. Therefore, the structure, the ultimate structure of the virus, um, you know, would change, leading to at least one mutation for each viral copy, right? So these mutations happen on a daily basis. And if you consider the amount and the number of viruses that are produced on a day by day basis, then you realize that we have mutations ongoing almost um, every second. Now, if you consider this, therefore, when you have a patient who is infected, you know, um, with uh, HIV, but not on treatment, they have this huge number you know, of viruses that are, are related genetically, you know, but they are unique, you know, and they are called a quasi species, right? And then each of these quasi species, remember they have 30 minutes <laughs> to, to do their papers, their, their, their life uh, papers. So it's all about survival, you know, of the fetus. So each subspecies of this huge pool of viruses has a, a potential to become dominant, right? And the virus generally with fewer mutation 
tends to be the, the, the one that is favored by the environment and therefore becomes the dominant virus amongst this uh, a population um, of viruses. So if I was to show you here, you've got groups of viruses. This is a quasi species. You've got your red uh, virus. These are susceptible. You know, uh, they do not have any significant mutations. In the absence of ARVs, right, your susceptible virus becomes the dominant uh, virus. If you take blood from your patient, you are going to probably draw lots and lots of these red viruses because the yellow ones are not the dominant. They are there, but they are not the dominant because the environment where the patient is untreated and is not on ARVs would always favor uh, uh, the virus that does not have mutations. If you start your patient on treatment, the environment changes. Remember, treatment would easily deal with the susceptible virus. It would become fewer and fewer of the red, and suddenly you get your resistant uh, quasi-species becoming the most dominant uh, uh, virus, right? This concept, why it looks easy, it's very important when you want to also to understand when is the right time to do a resistance test and how do you interpret the results depending on whether your patient at the time when the test was done was your patient on treatment or not because remember if you do a resistance test when your patient is not on ARVs the dominant virus would always be the susceptible virus and your results might come back and say susceptible, but that doesn't mean these guys here, the resistant guys are not there. They are just being suppressed by the dominant susceptible virus. However, if a patient comes in, they have a detectable viral load and they are on that treatment, even if it's a failing treatment, it would always suppress the susceptible virus such that your resistant bug is maintained as the dominant bug. If you do a resistance test at this point here, right, whilst your patient is on treatment, the likelihood that the resistance test would pick up the resistant uh, bug or virus is very high because uh, your patient is on um, treatment. So timing of doing a resistance test um, is quite um, um, crucial. And that's why we always want our patients to be on treatment when we do the test, but also pay attention to reasons why patients would have a detectable virus when they are already on ARVs. Things like a, a regimen that's not properly formulated in adequate drug levels, like drug-drug interactions tend to affect this poor adherence and pre-existing um, resistance, right? Now, just to help you also to understand the mutations, because in the previous session there, I showed you some mutations. I want you to understand where these mutations come from. So firstly, you have to appreciate that HIV is an RNA virus. Remember also our new bug here, COVID, is an RNA virus. We also have DNA. Uh, viruses, right? Now, this RNA, you think of it as a strand, like a strand, you know, which codes for certain proteins, right, which the virus requires uh, to function. So it, it has the code, and this code can be um, um, translated or interpreted and code for certain amino acids that would then code for, for certain uh, proteins. Now, on the strand, the strand itself, the RNA strand, right, there are codes. These codes are called codons. Remember a code, it has a message. Remember whenever it's a codon, it means it has a message. So each codon consists of three nucleotides. Now, I'm not sure if you remember uh, biochemistry there. You know, nucleotides are things like your uh, cytosine, guanine, adenosine, uh, thymidine, you know, that's why we, you know, so a combination. So each codon consists of three nucleotide, nucleotides and a combination of nucleotides would then code for amino acids. So if I was to summarize it, you've got an RNA strand. On the strand itself, there are codes. Now this code is made up of three nucleotides. When you interpret the code, <clears throat> it will give you a combination of amino acids 
which would lead to certain proteins. In other words, if the code changes, therefore the amino acids would be different and the shape of the virus would also be different. And that is how basically the mechanism under which resistance happens. When we say there is resistance or there is a mutation, we mean a code on the RNA strand on, uh, you know, changed, right? Changed, and when it changes, it leads to change to structural changes on the virus, which could make the virus more potent or even less uh, potent. And whenever you hear of this term wild type, right? These red susceptible viruses are generally called the wild type. The wild type is generally the, the susceptible uh, virus. This is the resistant virus. This is the wild type. A combination of the wild type and the resistant virus are called a quasi species, basically. So that is how um, 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 that is the language there. So if you look at an RNA strand, it will be a long strand, you know, containing codons, multiple codons, right? You'll see here triple A. So if you've got three, three A's there, they would code for an amino acid like lysine, GAC, aspartite, you know, ACT, and so on. Now, you can compare these two, right? The first code is still the same. The second code, something happened, right? The G was replaced by A. That means now, rather than coding for, for aspartite, we are now coding for a, a different amino acid um, right there. So therefore, this particular virus has uh, mutated. There is a change in the code leading to a different amino acid, which then would mean the proteins and the structure of the virus um, would change um, in that um, particular space. So when you look at our signature mutation, for example, for um, 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 Lamivudin, which is called M184V, M184V, it means M methionine at codon number 184 was replaced by valine. So it means uh, here, actually, I think I have a nice example. Yes, you see. So M184V is a signature mutation for lamivudine, and tricitabine, abacave. If you see a resistance test with this particular uh, mutation, it means at codon 184, under normal circumstances, we should have M there, methionine, right? However, when they now looked at the lab at 184, at, at number, codon number 184, instead of finding methionine there, they found that no, it was replaced with valine. So these codes, these mutations have meaning, right? Now, coming back here, if you look at the signature mutation for tenofovir, let's take tenofovir. Uh, and uh, abacave, they are generally affected by a mutation called K65R. K65, where's the R? Uh, R, there, you see. So it means at codon 65, under normal circumstances, we were supposed to find lysine. But as we investigated and we do the genotype, we find that at codon 65, lysine is not there. However, arginine has replaced lysine. That is the mutation right there, K65R. K103N, K103N. So at codon, 103, we were expecting lysine. It has since been displaced by asparagine, right? And right there, that is how you interpret uh, these mutations and how you make sense of these issues, you know? But what is very important is to note that a resistant bug would always, or these mutations would always happen when the virus is allowed to replicate in the presence of the drugs, right? And under what circumstances is this? It means there is reduced drug pressure, either because of drug-drug interaction, poor absorption, increased 
excretion, wrong dose, wrong potency, poor adherence, right? Leading to a resistant virus. But unfortunately, some patients are very good patients. They are adhering to treatment, but they were primarily um, infected. Um, they were primarily infected already with a resistant bug. So these are really two primary ways. You've got your primary, you know, um, 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 resistance. You've got your secondary resistance, which we call acquired um, resistance um, at that point in time. And just to summarize some of the mutations, M184V signature mutation for lamivudin, m bin. You've got your thymidine analogs, your TEMS, which would affect zidovudin more than anything. You've got your K65R right there, which you, would affect abacave and tenofove, you know, and then you've got the, your other mutations, you know, which are not so common, but can still, you know, um, um, okay, right. So remember for your NNRTIs, your signature mutation is K103N, but you can still get your Y181C, Y188C, you know, and so on, which would render the class really um, um, ineffective right there. For your protease inhibitors, you've got your V32I, your I47V or A, your V48, you know, and, and, and I think that, that really for, for me, the last two bullets are my key message to you. Number one is that the presence of mutations against Lopina Veritona V for argument's sake, right? Can offer, can confer high level resistance to Lopina V some mutations. However, these drugs are so potent such that for you to get high level resistance against your protein inhibitors, you generally need in excess of six mutations. And that's why we say our protease inhibitors have a high barrier to resistance because your NNRTIs, you need just one mutation most of the time and the whole class is out. And here you would need in excess of six to eight mutations to render you know, high level or complete resistance against those drugs, right? It's also very important to note that when you look at a hundred patients, right? You look at a hundred patients who present with a high viral load on a protease inhibitor, lopinavir, ritonavir, only about 16% would have at least one major mutation, not necessarily even high level or complete resistance. What does this tell us? It tells us that if you have a patient on a protease inhibitor regimen and they have a high viral load, most of the time they are not fading that regimen. It's probably because of poor adherence, uh, they are not tolerating the drug, you know, the diarrhea, uh, uh, which is usually a problem with lopinavir or even the taste when it comes um, to children. You would see there were 100 people with high viral loads, only 16 of these people had some important mutation. The rest had probably stopped taking treatment um, rather than us saying that they had uh, some um, high level um, resistance. Again, just comparing the different classes of drugs and you would see that your protease inhibitors are regarded as a class that has a high genetic barrier to resistance. That means it is not easy for a patient to fail um, this particular group of drugs and they would require a whole lot of mutations over time um, 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 to render the class ineffective. Also, a number of studies, you know, 17 studies, and we are just looking at how low, you know, what is the timeline? How long does it take for someone who's taking Lopina Veritonavir um, to ultimately fail and have major, you know, mutations? You'd see that if you, if, you, if you look at it very carefully, it's around two to three years, right? Most of these studies around three years there, you know, two to three years. That's when you, you, and that's why you'll see our guidelines not recommending us to be switching, you know, patients who have high viral loads on a PI regimen, unless if they have taken that regimen for at least two years. So it takes at least two years to develop some of the major uh, mutations that would render your protease um, inhibitors um, less uh, uh, effective uh, right there, right? <clears throat> And again, even when you compare the different drugs by the, the, the potency, 
you know, their, <clears throat> their, their ability to suppress the drug on their own against, you know, the genetic barrier to resistance, you will see that your protease inhibitors it will always come out tops. You will see even on second line, we always say DTG, you need a, a, a strong NRTI backbone, but with protease inhibitors, it's not always the case. You can still get away with a weakened uh, backbone because these drugs are very potent and they also have a high genetic barrier to, to resistance. So they are very trusted uh, in terms of, you know, um, the regimens um, that we use, right? But uh, what are some of the reasons, you know? Um, so firstly, the development of protease inhibitor resistance, I think that is the summary really from me to you to say it is uncommon. And when you see a patient with a high viral load on a protease inhibitor regimen, you, your first suspicion should not be that they are failing, it should be that there's issues that need to be addressed, you know, uh, probably issues around adherence um, um, and so on. And the reasons are these drugs are potent, they have a high genetic barrier to resistance. But remember, our second line ART regimen has lamivudine there. And lamivudine is known to reduce you know, viral fitness, you know, um, and making the virus to replicate rather slow. You know, that is why in South Africa now, when a patient is taking a second line ART regimen right, second line ART regimen, and uh, it's a protease inhibitor regimen. We don't just look at the viral load level, right, to decide if they are failing. It is important that a genotype test is done, and in interpreting this uh, genotype test, a score is allocated against each drug that has been uh, uh, tested on the genotype test. And you would see that when you interpret your genotype test, if you see a score of between zero to nine, it means that drug is still working, it's still susceptible. And therefore adherence is probably the biggest problem uh, we need to deal with, right? Once it crosses nine and we get into 10 to 14, we say there's a potential for low level resistance. So it's not even yet low level resistance, because low level resistance, we talk about a score of 15 to 29, intermediate 30 to 59. And obviously, if you see a score above 60, that means there is high level resistance. That means significant mutations, major mutations that would render that particular drug ineffective have been detected uh, in the uh, virus of that particular patient. And therefore, that particular drug needs to be replaced uh, with a better um, 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 drug. And that is the score, you see. And we call it a PI score. And for someone to even be considered to be failing a protease inhibitor, they need to have a PI score of more than 15. In other words, if someone is taking lopinavir, ritonavir, and you do a genotype test and the result comes back as 12, no, they are not yet failing. It means lopinavir, ritonavir is still very effective, right? We become worried when the level of resistance against lopinavir, ritonavir is way above 15. Then we are quite um, concerned about our patients. So if you have a patient who has taken lopinavir, ritonavir for more than two years, you have repeated viral loads and they're remaining high, right? You have to order a genotype test. And if the test comes back and there's some mutations against lopinavir, ritonavir, and these mutations, the score is below 15, you, 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 you have to deal with adherence and help your patient to, to reassess. The, the, the committee, the third line committee at NDOH would not even look at that case because the lopina there is still active and you need to address whatever social issues are going on there. However, if your score has crossed 15, let's say the PI score there, the resistance score for your lopina very toner there is 80, <clears throat> then your patient has failed and you would refer, and the, the, the third line committee is likely to recommend a regimen combination that has these three drugs. Firstly, Juranavir, which is our, our best protease inhibitor. 
with Lami Vudin and whatever NRTI backbone that is still effective, right? So they'll either get Zido Vudin, Lami Vudin with Jurana Vey, right? But before you stop, you have to assess the scores of either your NRTIs or Jurana Vey. Remember, if you keep patients on a protease inhibitor and they are failing for longer periods of time, your Jurana Vey can also start to become compromised, even if they had never taken the drug before. So if on the same resistance results, your score for Jurana Vey is a 20 for argument's sake, that means you can't stop here. You now have to add an integrase um, inhibitor, right? Or if your tenofovir and zidovudin, whatever you're going to use as your NRTI backbone is already compromised, you have to add now the fourth drug, which is an integrase um, inhibitor right there. Some patients have a triple class, you know, um, high level resistance. That means they have a high PI score, they have a high NNRTI and, and your NN, I mean your NRTI and your NNRTI, you know, um, are compromised, you know, and you might need then to add um, ultravarine as part of you know the regimen if it is still um, sensitive um, right there. So some patients will get three drugs, some patients will get four drugs, some patients will get five drugs. It all depends on what is the score that has been uh, um, given against the key classes of drugs um, that we need to use. So let me show you, uh, uh, let's do a case. So unfortunately case, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry that I kept on, you know, Kate is, keep, is keeping on coming back, but I think because we, we know about Kate, that's what we started with. She should give us a sense of what we need to do. So remember now, just to remind you of Kate, she came in, we saw her at 12 months. She had a viral load of 1,500. She was previously suppressed. She was on TB treatment, but we forgot to dose adjust um, her regimen, right? And then at 18 months, you would see the viral load went to in excess of 20,000, 24 months, 16,000. We last saw her here at 24 months. And she was then switched to Zidovudin, Lamivudin, Lopinave, Ritonave, right? The problem we have is that the six months after her switch, she is still not fully suppressed. The viral load has improved. I mean, it's 4,000, you know, uh, more than one log drop. So, you know, but we would have wanted her to be suppressed. But she has complained. She's complaining of a high pill burden. She reluctantly reports missing several doses. So, you know, for the first time, it seems like adherence is a big issue. However, she's still clinically, you know, um, stable. So now this is a complex case uh, by no means, you know, because ideally, even at this point, you, you want to discuss <laughs> with an expert because um, uh, it's not a case that you might need to deal with. And if you are working at a clinic, if you do not have a doctor trained on uh, uh, advanced clinical care, it's always best to discuss with your HIV doctor at the clinic or an infectious disease hospital if you have access um, to such um, in your province. So let's then uh, discuss uh, 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 this case and see what your options are. If you see a patient recently switched to second line, Zidovudin, Lamivudin, Lopinave, and the patient is not resuppressing, um, um, I mean, what do you want to do? What do you want to do at this point in time? Mm. Yeah, it's a, there's no, <laughs> there's obvious, uh, you know, options that are very option that are very obvious that we won't um, select. Let's all participate, but uh, there's options that are, that we should uh, consider uh, in any case. So. Yeah, I'll give you five more seconds because I want all of you to participate. Come guys, let's participate. It helps a lot when you participate. Yes, yes, yes. All right. So I'm going to stop here and then uh, share with you um, the results. So this is what we are looking at at this point in time. So utterance, yes, because she's missing doses and she's complaining about the number of tablets that there are many. Switching head to third line, 
yeah, you know, one is starting to think about it, but as to whether the timing is right, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced. And then conduct resistance test. Yeah, it's a 50-50 decision, that one. You know, um, remember she has just recently been switched. So she hasn't been on Lopinave for more than two years, but we know that she has never suppressed before. And maybe there's a drug history we don't know. Uh, we might consider it, but I just still think it's too early. Maybe we need to deal with the adherence issues first and then maybe consider the resistance test later. Continue the current regimen, most likely, and repeat the viral load in six months' time, most likely. I think those are probably the two things. We just need to monitor that she does not clinically deteriorate because the last time her CD4 count was way below um, a, a hundred. So, you know, there are no uh, obvious answers, but there's a discussion that you need to have uh, with an expert so that collectively you can then decide on what is best uh, for her. So here is her resistance test result, right? So, um, um, so one, some of you said, let's do a resistance test. And I said, probably not. That means I wouldn't do it. Uh, I would probably do it after six months, but there's always a motivation for and against, and that's not the, uh, the issue really. But let's look at this resistance results, right? So Zidovudin, the score is 10. Remember, this means it's low level resistance. It's been interpreted for you. The score has been given. Lamivudin, high level resistance, right? Remember anything you know, above 60 there is high level resistance. But remember, this is a mutation that we like, we prefer to keep because yes, it's a mutation, but it's a mutation that makes the virus to be less effective. It reduces the viral fitness. So we, we prefer to maintain it. Um, Abacave, it's low level because of uh, some of these mutations, m and so on. But look at your, your Lopina V. Uh, there. Lopina very retona very susceptible. The score is zero, right? She's got a high viral load, right? Remember the viral load is uh, four, was it 4,000? Uh, but the Lopina V score says, no, I am susceptible, right? So, so absorb these results because I have a question for you, you know? So you have a patient who's, who's taking a Lopina V retona V regimen and uh, it is uh, after, with a high viral load, your, your resistance test says susceptible, you know. Um, you know, and, and, and please, you know, something that maybe I must also help you to interpret with caution, right? Is something like what you are seeing there with tenor of me. You must remember what I said earlier. I said, if you, you, you do a resistance test, and the, the patient is not taking a certain drug, the resistance test results will, might not show you mutations against that particular drug. So you see here, the test, I mean, the result says 10 f v is susceptible. But me and you, we know that this patient failed 10 f v previously. So why is the genotype saying susceptible? What is going on there, <laughs> right? What is the story? The story is simple, is that at the time when the genotype test was done, the patient was not taking tenofovir. Very important to note. If you say, no, tenofovir is sensitive, let's give tenofovir, you'll be shocked to see K65R reappearing right there, and suddenly you have a high level resistance to tenofovir. So that's why you should always interpret a, a, a genotype test based on the drug history of the patient and the timing, you know, at what time was this test done and therefore how do we um, interpret it correctly? So that is quite um, um, important in interpreting. So a susceptible here, you have to interpret it. Don't just say it's susceptible, let's stop Zidovudin and give Tenofov. You'll be shocked uh, the kind of harm um, you would do. So, so what is the, 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 the PI score there? So the PI score for, for our patient is zero. So the PI score is far from 15. So you are not going to refer uh, uh, our case to the third line committee. They will not accept uh, this case because there is no PI score basically um, in this uh, instance, 
All right. So very, you, 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 the algorithm, you can't even continue because you can only continue if the PI score there was 15, 20, 30, 40, 60, then you would continue and decide what kinds of regimens you know, your patient would be uh, eligible for, right? So unfortunately, no PI score. So let's discuss genotype testing because it's very important. I tell you, uh, you'll be fighting with the third line committee there because, and I get a lot of uh, private uh, doctors, especially GPs calling me and say, hey, I have a genotype test. Can I read it to you? I'm saying, no, 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 no. Don't read it to me. I need more information. The history of the patient, all the drug switches, when did the patient fail? When did the patient start? You also want information about at the time when the test was done. Was the patient on ARVs? Which ARVs was the patient on? What was the viral load? Because these are the otherwise you, 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 you want. So the pros is that your genotype test can be used to detect mutations that are causing resistance. Remember, read the sentence fully on a current regimen. Remember our patient, I was telling you about tenofovir. So it cannot detect resistance for the drugs that the patient is currently not taking, even if the patient had previously failed those drugs, right? Very important. It can also help to conserve treatment options by showing ineffective drugs with a particular within a particular regimen. So it can show you which drugs not to use, but a genotype test cannot show you which drugs to use. So please, it's English, but I'm hoping you are following, right? When you do a genotype test, it can only tell you, don't use this, don't use this. It cannot tell you, use this, use this. Going back to our genotype, right? If you look at it, we know that the, uh, we, 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 there's high resistance to this one, there's high resistance to that. So we know what not to use, but we don't know what to use because susceptible might be because of at the time when the test was done, the current regimen did not have tenofovir. Therefore, the genotype cannot measure whether there's tenofovir resistance um, um, or not, right? And what are the cons? The cons are that it requires a viral load to be at least in excess of a thousand copies. Now it cannot detect also the minority of the variants, right? So if the variants are in a minority in terms of the overall uh, uh, viral population, some of the mutations can be missed, which is quite um, important and will only detect currently circulating strains with no information on archive. That's what I was telling you about tenofovir to say, we know me and you from the drug history that we switched this patient from tenofovir after failure. Probably the K65R mutation is stored, it's archived, and it will be re-expressed once we put the patient on tenofovir, an archived mutation will be expressed, and then we need to be able to deal with that. Like I said, it is better in determining which drugs won't work than which drugs will work. As to which drugs will work, drug history, drug switches, current regimen, and, and, and you know, so, so, so we don't use a genotype test to tell us what to use. We just want to know which drugs are fully out. So that is um, the key message there really uh, from me, right? So, um, um, so here we are. So remember we saw her here. Uh, six months ago, it was 4,000. We said, no, continue treatment. Let's deal with adherence, you know, and now we are at 36 months. Uh, you know, her viral load is going up again, which is 36. I mean, 13,000 and the CD4 count is 49, right? So remember when we saw her at 30 months, we did the resistance test and we figured, no, where now you have poor adherence, let's deal with your adherence issues. Now it's 36 months, six months down the line, we have repeated the viral load. And look at what's going on. Now she's got oral sores. Presuming this is candida, that means you know things are not going well. Um, she seems to be adherent this time around. She's been taking her medicines. She's still clinically stable, but she's got candida. Look at her CD4 count, which is 49 um, right there. So as we are about to summarize this case, so the first option there, virological treatment failure, I think that one we have heard it for years. I think we are just stuck between at what point 
you know, do we decide to switch her? So yes, she does meet in a, to a certain extent the biological failure. Yes, though she's not yet two years on a PI, but she's been failing forever. So really she's failing. There is immunological failure. The CD4 count is now 49, which is the lowest ever level. Clinical failure, I believe so. Because remember, all along she was asymptomatic, right? She was a stage one patient in a way. Now she's developing a stage three medical condition. However, clinical failure, uh, by definition, it's not just oral candida. It's defined as the development of a stage four medical condition after taking effective heart for at least six months. So, you know, she's clinically deteriorating, but not necessarily a 100% clinical failure. Poor adherence, still a question. So all of the above, most likely, but it seems like she, she's, uh, she has changed. She has, she has attended reliably, her pill counts and so on. So there is that element that she's really trying, you know, to, to do her part right there. So then can I just ask you um, um, at this point in time, what do you believe is, is the correct uh, stage for this uh, patient? How would you stage her? Though I think I've given you tips already. <laughs> What is the most uh, correct uh, WHO stage? Uh, okay. <laughs> Come five more seconds. Ah, it, just, it stopped. Okay. I thought that was going to relaunch. Can I see if there's a way of relaunching? But anyway, uh, let's discuss it. It's fine. So just uh, for a few seconds, uh, stage three is the correct one. Oral candida stage three, she's not yet stage four, she would be stage four if she had usophageal um, candida. Um, so yeah, uh, we stop it at that. Um, so during these 36 months with this viral load and CD4 count, uh, what is your plan as we sum up uh, this case? What is your plan? What is your plan? Mm -hmm. Finally. <laughs> yes, 10 more seconds as we sum up. Yes, let's all vote. Five more seconds. Let's all participate. Yes, 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 yes. Let's also participate. All right, all right, I'm going to stop and then I'm going to show you um, your results because we can only wait uh, 40 seconds, that's fine. So yes, uh, arterial support always, resistance test, yes. I think, and, and the reason why I think it must be repeated is the following, the previous one, remember, we, we sort of thought um, she had poor adherence, therefore let's continue the treatment, repeat the viral load in six months time. But now she's uh, immunologically and clinically deteriorating. So we need to recheck if, because remember, if we don't confirm mutations, we can't refer to the third line committee. So even the refer to third line committee there, uh, it is pending if we confirm that uh, there are mutations that we will uh, pick up. So very important. So I think we will continue the regimen, do the resistance test, then act based on the resistance test results and provide utterance counseling um, in the meantime. So that, that sounds like a, like a plan, right? So here we are. So second line regimens. If a patient is taking a PI-based regimen for more than two years, in our case, she has taken it for less than two years, but she's clinically deteriorating. Her CD4 count is dropping, right? We need to do a resistance test. So now a resistance test is indicated right there. And uh, depending on whether we confirm resistance or not, uh, uh, we will decide. Remember, if we don't find any resistance, we have to continue the regimen, deal with the resistance issues, discuss with an expert and see if we can make the regimen simpler, if there's better regimens, and I doubt really, but we can try, right? And then uh, if uh, there's confirmed resistance, therefore we, we refer to the third line committee, they would interpret the resistance results for us and then recommend a regimen on a named patient basis. 
and then we act uh, like that. So here is the resistance uh, profile um, of our patient. Remember at the time when the test was done, she was taking Zidovudin, Lamivudin, and Lopinavir, Ritonavir. You can see that Zidovudin is now intermediate. So it's, uh, she's accumulated more and more mutations. Previously, it was low level. You know, Lamivudin is uh, also still a very high level resistance. But uh, look at your, your, your Lopina V, Ritona V, right there. Lopina V, Ritona V, now it's high level resistance, right? The score is way above uh, 60 days. So it's high level resistance. We are now very, very worried. And remember what I said, if you keep a patient on a failing regimen for longer periods of time, they accumulate more and more mutations which would reduce the effectiveness of your other uh, protease inhibitors. You can see there's already a score of five, even if she has not yet been exposed to Juranavir. So this is very important that at the right time, the denotype test is done and the switching has to be done. Not three years, not four years, but around two years. Very, very, very um, crucial at that point in time. So the PI score is above 15, what do I mean? Because protease inhibitor there is 80, right? That means the new regimen would have to be do a Juranavir, which is a new protease inhibitor, plus Lamivudin, right? And then we have to choose between Zidovudin and Tenofovir. Now that choice is very important because if you choose uh, Tenofovir because it's 15, you might be misled by the fact that at the time when the test was done, the patient was not on tenofovir. Therefore, there is an archived K65 array, very high potential for that, right? And your Zidovudin right there is 55, so it's quite high, right? So if we opt to give Zidovudin uh, with Lamivudin and Juranavir, right? We then have to assess whether our NRTI score is above 50, and you can see it would be above 50. I mean, it, it, above 30, it is above 30 because Zidovudin was 55, right? So that's if you give Zidovudin, Lamivudin, Juranavir, you would, in addition, need to add Dolutegravir back into the regimen um, right there. So your patient will be taking four drugs, Juranavir, Lamivudin, Zidovudin, and Dolutegravir, right? Um, um, that is how it would work. Then we need to assess if we have a score of Juranavir that is also above 15, and luckily, no, the score is five. So we don't need to add l right? So this patient will take four drugs, probably Juranavir, Lamivudin, Zidovudin, and Dolutegravir, right? I don't trust uh, 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 as thinking that tenofovir will come back sensitive. But if you, if you take tenofovir, you might stop at three drugs. But to be honest, uh, my sense is that um, um, I would go for four. And these arguments that I'm raising, whether we're going to give three or four drugs, we leave them to the experts at the National Department of Health, the third line committee, because these are not easy decisions um, um, to take because you would see that means if you give TDF, FTC, Juranavir there, uh, there's no need to continue. But me and you, we know that this is low level, but there's a previous history and a potential for an archive mutation. So these are things that are discussed at the third line committee. So at our level, we don't really engage, we just receive the drugs back, but it's always good uh, to learn and, and to master the, the, the algorithms and know exactly what the third line committee does when we refer um, our patients. So if it's TDF, because the score is low, three drugs are fine. If it's AZT, because the score is above 30, you would have to add DTG. And it's an argument really to be discussed at the high uh, level right there, right? So remember, <clears throat> once you have confirmed resistance, uh, for, to your protease inhibitor, you then need to complete the form. Please complete it fully because the third line committee would struggle to engage uh, with your case. Because if you don't tell them that the patient previously failed DTG or previously failed Tenofovir, 
then they would make um, incorrect um, 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 proposals there. And then we refer to the third line um, um, email there, tlart at health.gov. Um, dot ZA. And then just to close this session to say, remember, if we do not switch on time, people end up, you know, failing and becoming sick, they might need to be admitted. But in addition to that, they accumulate more and more mutations, which would compromise, you know, the future ART regimens, and then leading to us infecting and infecting uh, more people. To manage a high viral load, always identify the cause, address the problem, you know, um, repeat the viral load um, as much as possible, discuss with an expert, and then consider um, a regimen switch um, as uh, deemed um, necessary. All right. So thank you very much. I hope uh, this session was worth your time and that you have managed to really grasp you know, how to approach whether a patient is failing DTG or a PI regimen. Mm -hmm.